here. Jesus is here in this room tonight. Why don't you lift up your hands? All over the room, lift up your hands to Jesus. I was a beggar. Now I'm royalty. I was a prisoner. But now I'm running free. I'm forgiven. I'm accepted. I'm redeemed by His grace. So let the house of the Lord sing praise and worship, honor and glory to Jesus. From a thankful heart we give you praise. All the love in our hearts says we love you, Jesus. God, we worship you. Come on, let the abundance of your heart speak in this moment. You sing your own song to Jesus. praise you nobody like you nobody above you or beside you Jesus in my life how I love you so thank you so full of gratitude
So I throw up my hands. So I throw up my hands. I praise you again and again. All that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's not. church you can do better than that come on do you love Jesus this evening come on don't you love him we love you Lord can we just do this real quick can we just just, just position our hearts as we've done in worship can we just ask the Lord that he would just be with us that we'd open up our, our hearts and our ears and our minds can you just feel there's just a there's a transition And it's not like this physical transition. We're talking there's a spiritual transition that's happening. In fact, for this church and for all those who are guests today, you may not know this. We're coming into the close of 21 days of fasting and prayer. It's been strategic fasting and prayer, and it's not an accident that the guests that we have here tonight and the topic that we're going to cover tonight is strategic, not just for our region, but for our state and more importantly for our nation. Today, we got to position our hearts to receive the mandate that Jesus has for his people. The mandate for the church to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And I don't know about you, but we've been praying as in, in heaven has been our prayer. On earth as it is in heaven. As it in his heaven has been our focus this week. And can I tell you, God has something he's trying to establish on earth. But he's going to need people that will just embrace the idea of bringing heaven to earth. We know that that we are under a covenant in heaven. There is a covenant that we are actually operating under right now. There is no depression in heaven today. There's no anxiety in heaven. See, the people have to believe that in order for us to manifest it here on earth. And can I tell you, God is going to do something. Can we just position our hearts to receive what he has for us? Can we just pray this? Would you open up our hearts, God? Open up our minds and our spirits. Would you make us ready to receive the word of the Lord today? God, we thank you as we just position our hearts, God. Our prayer today is simply this. You be glorified. Your will be done, not my will, God. Your ways, not my ways, God. God, we thank you that as we've fasted and prayed, as we've as we've consecrated our hearts and our lives, God, for this moment, the alignment of your purpose and destiny to the obedience of fasting and prayer, God, we thank you today that you're going to speak clear. And God, we open up our hearts to receive. And God, we say yes before we even know what the mandate is. We say yes before we even know what you're asking us to do. We want there to be a, 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 a ready yes in our hearts and in our mouths. God, we will go. We will do. We will say. We will become all that you ask us to be, God. Give us the grace. Give us the courage. Give us wisdom, insight, and direction. Give us the words to pray when we run out of words, God. Help fill our mouths, God, with that that stirs your heart, God. We want to come into alignment with that that you're already proclaiming on the earth. We don't want what we want. We want what you want, Father. We want to advance your kingdom. We want to advance your kingdom, and we want to be a part, God, of the movement of what you're trying to do. We thank you for the men and the women that are here tonight, those that will invest into us, God, I pray that you'd anoint them in a new and a fresh way to deliver, God, the message, the words, the faith, the prayer, God, that has gone into the preparation of this night, God, I pray, God, that will all intersect tonight with power, with an anointing, with a clarion call to do and to be all that you call your church, your body to be and to do. God, we say yes to that tonight. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing in this house tonight. We bless your name. We're grateful. We're thankful today for all that you've done, all that you provided. If, it, if that this was the end of it, it would be plenty. 
God, you promise so much more. We just come into agreement with that tonight. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen, amen. Come on, do you love Jesus tonight? Hey, listen, I want you to turn around somebody. Greet them real big. Tell them you're glad to see them here tonight. For all those who are joining us online tonight, we love you. It's an honor to have you joining us. It's going to be a powerful, powerful night. All right, all right. For, uh, for all of our guests, let me introduce myself. My name is Scott Silcox, one of the pastors here, executive pastor. I just want to say it's an honor to have you here tonight. We know that you could be anywhere you chose to be here. It means so much to us. We're excited to have you because it's, it is a special night. In just a, a moment, Pastor Lisa is going to come up and introduce some of our guests today. And uh, I, I just can't wait for you to meet these guys that are here. I can't wait for you to hear the story that's going to be told today. Uh, and it's not, uh, for some of you, maybe not a brand new story, but I would say for, for the most, most of you, it might be the full story that you've been waiting to hear. And uh, in, anyway, I don't want to spoil the surprise. Pastor Lisa is going to get to all the introductions. I do want to remind you that Friday night, we will be having our night of prayer and worship. We are still having that. That is this Friday night, starts at 6.30, one-hour prayer service. We encourage you to come out and be a part of that. And then, of course, we kick off Champions Champion Summit is right here on us, so that will kick off Sunday, and that's going to kick off with Krista Smith and Sean Smith. They're going to be coming in from Oakland, California to be a part of this, and they're going to be kicking it off for us, and I encourage you, if you have not already signed up for Champion Summit, it is not too late, and I would encourage you to please do this. We believe this. What started off as a leadership investment has through this time of prayer and fasting, God has really arrested our hearts that this is going to be actually uh, three days, four days of just revival services. Just, uh, uh, and just going after God in very unique and specific ways. In fact, it's not an accident that we even had a, cancel a cancellation of one speaker. And, uh, uh, and that was on our Wednesday night. Uh, uh, I think Daniel Kalinda was, was not able to be with us. But, but then all of a sudden, out of the blue, a phone call uh, from Glenn Berto. And uh, you may not know him, but you need to know him. This man died 11 times on the table. 11 times. And, and, and has, is now going from church to church and just giving a message on the power of and the work of Jesus through healing. And can I tell you, how many know that, that the, gospel, uh, 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 the gospel absent of power is not the gospel? I'm going to let Glenn Berto talk about that when he gets here, okay, so that you can actually believe what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, the, the gospel absent of power, go read your Bible. Jesus operated that way, and he wants to invest that into us. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's going to be a powerful time. It is free to come to the night sessions. We only ask you to sign up so that we know if you're bringing your children and we know how to take care of you. That's really it. And so we encourage you to go online and do that. It's not too late. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a powerful, powerful, powerful time. So please consider that. Pray with us this weekend. We really believe God is bringing a fresh word for this house and for this season. But can I tell you, it's, we don't have to wait till Sunday. He's got something to say to us right here tonight. Pastor Lisa, uh, as you come, it's offering time we get to give. Amen? We get to give. Awesome. We clap around here because we know this. There's nothing that we have that didn't come from him first. We believe this. We get to steward the resources he places in our hands. And can we just do this? Can we just give honor to whom honor is due? Can we just thank the Lord for what he's doing in the way of provision for this church, allowing us to partner with him in advancing the kingdom in our city? That's what we get to do. And I'm sure glad that he trusts me and he trusts you. Can we honor him today? If your husband and wife would you join hands, we want to pray over you. If you came prepared to give in any form of cash, check, something like that, you can do that in the drop box or you can do it just by doing uh, a 77977. It's a text cast, so you can put that number in or just scan the QR code. Most of you are already doing that on a regular basis, so you know how to handle it. All right, let's pray before we get here going. God, we honor you today. 
And God, we bless our families today. We thank you for those who are stepping out in faith, maybe for the first time. God, I pray that you'd anoint them. God, as we step out in worship today and we give back to you that that you already invested into us, our prayer, God, is help us to be good stewards of the things you place in our hands. God, I pray favor over our families today and strength and grace as they love on their kids. God, I pray that you would bless them in unique and special ways. God, I pray for all of our single moms and dads today. We come into agreement with a covenant God who knows right where we're at. We recognize this. You're not moved, God, by need. You're moved by faith. And so today we lend our faith with those who need it the most. God, I pray that you provide every single resource they need in this season as they're raising up good godly young men and women. God, I pray this for all of our business and business owners today. God, I pray a just blessing on their dreams, ideas, visions, things they've been sitting on. God, I pray that you'd bless every meeting that they sit in, God, that as they speak, God, it's impossible not to be heard clear. God, because you've seeded their hearts with a vision that would change the direction and the course of not just their life and their company's life, but the employees that call it home. I pray it's hard to leave their businesses because they're being so blessed. God, I pray that you just continue that increase in every area of their influence. We thank you for it. And lastly, those who are looking for jobs, those who are trying to find a way, those who are trying to relocate and figure out where they belong, we recognize this. Jesus, you open the doors. You close the doors. God, you are the provider. It's not us. It's you. It's not our good work. It's not our good deeds. We put hard work to the opportunities you place in front of us. And God, we give you the credit for it. We recognize that you are in control of all of these things. And we give you the glory the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. Pastor Lisa. I don't think that you realize what we're in store for. Um, But before we begin our introductions, I'm actually going to introduce someone and invite him to come up and help me introduce our two guests tonight. Before I do that, because I'm going to do it the right way, he, he deserves to be introduced in a very, very special way. I want to explain something that just happened to me as I was sitting there. When I realized who I was sitting next to and who I'm about to introduce to you. I knew that when when we stepped into this fast, God was speaking that our theme was on earth as it is in heaven. And we had to have a full understanding what that was. What is that truly? When he told us how to pray on earth, bringing it on earth as it has already been established in heaven. It's a Greek word. It's a judicial word. And the message that you heard Sunday, if you did not get to hear Sunday's message that I pre-recorded because of the weather, I talked about that. Because when we understand that there is a court of heaven where God has already hit the gavel and said, this is what I've declared for my kingdom, our job is not wrestling here, but stepping into the courts of heaven and being a part of bringing his kingdom to earth. Do, do, do you understand that? It's a judicial thing. And so God always mirrors in the spirit realm what he's doing in the physical realm. And we found out today that a very special guest was going to be here with us tonight. And it is no coincidence that God would do this. And so in the house tonight, and he's going to join me, is Alabama's Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker. You need to stand and welcome him tonight. Amen. Lisa, thank you for opening the door here tonight for what they're getting ready to see. As Chief Justice, I'm over about 3,000 people in the judicial system. I have brought all of my judges here to Huntsville this week for continuing judicial education. Part of what we've been doing in the judicial system is what everybody's doing after we were hit in the face with the George Floyd tragedy. It made us take a deeper look at where we are interracially. Now we have black and white judges across the state. We're able to work together, but it takes much more than pleasantries and accommodation. We need to go down deep within us and confront every vestige of racism so that we can really do the work as Roman 13 ministers to administer justice 
here in Alabama. Now, in the court system, we've been dealing with this as much as we can in the flesh. But this week, I'm stretching the, the limits. <laughs> And I brought in a pair to speak that had the most extraordinary story that they're going to share with you. It's a story of how they came together in prayer. And as they journeyed side by side walking through this, you will not believe the incredible, amazing difficulties that God threw in their way. And how he enabled them to overcome that, to be a voice for reconciliation in America today. Now, it's also a story of how when they began and were faithful to walk this out, God began elevating each of them within their own sphere. Matt Lockett now is head of the Justice House of Prayer in Washington, D.C., and bound for life. You've seen the pictures of all those young people out in front of the Supreme Court with the red tape over their mouth, life. I have to tell you that when I was elected in 2004, I did something unique. I went to Washington, D.C. and had Clarence Thomas swear me in. And Lou Engel was there with me. And Clarence couldn't keep from asking all these questions. Tell me about those red tapes. What's, what's that you're doing out there? <laughs> They're having an impact. Now, Will, in his separate uh, elevation by the Lord, went on to be president of Christ for the Nations Institute in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. He followed Dutch Sheets in that position. But Dutch left because he felt God calling him to re-spark the prayer initiative in America. And Will has left that position because this message is so important and timely for America today that he wants to devote himself entirely to it. And God is providing and honoring for him to do that. You are in for a real treat tonight. And as you hear this, and it affects you personally, I want you to be in prayer that it will have the same effect on the judges of Alabama, yeah. Thursday and Friday. So, thank you. You may be seated. As they're coming, I want to remind you what he just said. Our 3,000 judges that are coming will be hearing this story and so pray for them over these next two days intercede for them that their hearts will be open and we shift our state I love you. can we give it up for pastor lisa come on <laughs> yeah let's give it up come on also to pastor nelson couldn't be can we give it up for pastor rusty nelson come on ah oh. My friend, my compadre, God, we bless Pastor Rusty. We thank you so much for the angel of this house. God, and the amazing leadership team with Scott and so many others. I thank God for y'all. You can be seated. It's such an honor, y'all, to be back here with you. You know, uh, I met Pastor Rusty a couple of times. One, 2008, with a, uh, at, a, at a gathering we did with uh, Lou Engel in Alabama. And uh, then I had the privilege to go to Israel, and our hearts just connected together. It's like, man, where have you been in my life? We were both saying that to each other, and we just got connected to each other. So I'm Will Ford from the Will Ford Matt Locker story, and uh, we come with props. So if you haven't seen this before, we come with props. This is my friend Matt Lockett. And so um, the, muscle. <laughs> the muscle behind <laughs> the looks, right? <laughs> So we've written a, a book about our story, which is 
which is becoming a documentary, coming to a theater new you. Yeah. Yes. So thank y'all for praying this in. And the name of the book is called The Dream King, How the Dream of Martin Luther King is Being Fulfilled to Heal Racism in America. Get the book before the movie comes out. Matter of fact, we have several, of, several copies here tonight for you guys. Because what we're going to share with you is like the tip of the iceberg of the story. And I shared this, I think, a couple of years ago. It was just little old me. I'm pretty good <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> Don't ask Matt. He might say otherwise. <laughs> but honestly, this story wrecks me when we get to share it together. And, uh, and I think it's going to have the same effect on you. Because one, two are better than one. But to hear him share it and us share it together in the presence of God that comes with that is so, so powerful. So thank you all for the privilege of sharing this tonight. Judge Parker, thank you so much for bringing us in. This is unprecedented. And um, if y'all would turn with me in your Bibles or turn on your Bibles to John 17. John 17. This is the red letter stuff, right? This is Jesus. And what is he doing? He's praying for us. We get to overhear Jesus praying for us. You ever think of it like that? I remember once when I overheard my mama praying for me, right? I was during the summer break. I was at Morehouse College at the time. I was a sophomore, come home for the, for the summer. Some of my friends came in from out of town who were also from, from Morehouse. And so we're there in the DFW area, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so I thought I would do what I, would, what I did in Atlanta on the weekends. I was a backslidden knucklehead at this time, y'all. <laughs> so I went out clubbing with my friends, right? Go out clubbing with my friends, but then realizing, oh, man, I'm about to walk in my mama's house a little tipsy. And she don't know that side of me. <laughs> so I come creeping to my mama's house like at 3 in the morning. But guess who's up praying for me at 3 in the morning? <laughs> my mama. She's going to town. Devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Jezebel, I see you. I, I plead the blood, the blood, the blood. Most saints knew something about the blood, right? I'm like, no wonder I couldn't get a date tonight. Mama's blocking everything, right? <laughs> blocking everything. Heard one preacher say it like this. He said, the only difference between a praying mama and a pit bull is lipstick. Because a praying mama, she don't let go either, you know? And, and I, my mother's normally real quiet, y'all. She's really a little quiet lady. It's the first time I've heard my mother pray like that. 45 minutes, at least an hour, I'm on the outside of that door just listening to her, just, just go in and in prayer. Talking about a buzzkill? That was a buzzkill. <laughs> a couple of years later, when I was like, for real, for real, gave my life to the Lord. <laughs> You know that for real, for real time. Like, this is not the time where you go to church when all the cute girls are there and just kind of walk down the aisle. No. No, I remember when I, like, for real surrendered my life to the Lord. My late 20s. And um, I told my mother, I said, Mommy, there's one moment I couldn't get away from. It was the way I overheard you praying for me. I said, it branded me. You had no idea what mark that left on my life and on my heart. I said, thank you for praying for me. She didn't know I was... They're listening to you that night and that summer. But thank you for praying. She said, oh, I knew you were there. I knew you were there the whole time. <laughs> I just wanted you to know what got a place in my heart concerning his plan, his purpose, his destiny for your life and how I was contending for it and I wasn't giving up on it. Church, I want to submit to you. In John 17, Jesus is allowing us to overhear his prayer meeting for us. It should brand us. It should sober up the church. Here's what he says. John 17, look at verse 17. He says this, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, talking about the 12 disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Turn to your neighbor and say, now he's praying for you. What is he praying? That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given to me, I've given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. 
I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And it's powerful. So we're living in this time, of course, all the things that are going on with coronavirus, pandemics, shutdowns, quarantines. And then we got to the place where a couple of years ago, social distancing revealed the social distance in our hearts, right? But I believe in the midst of all this, y'all, God hadn't forgotten about his son's prayer. He overheard his prayer meeting. He's overhearing yours, too. And he's going to use the United Church to heal a divided nation. Amen? I want to share with you, my friend Matt Locker, the amazing story of what God is not just doing in our lives, what he's doing through this church, what he's doing in the state of Alabama. Because guess what? Our story has roots in Alabama. All that to say, let's pray. Jesus! We absolutely love you. God, we give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Release the spirit of wisdom and revelation in our midst. We overheard your son praying for us, Father. Give us the grace to respond to his voice. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Well, some of y'all saw Matt putting this up here for me, and uh, this is actually a cast iron kettle pot that's about 200 years old. <laughs> And it's connected to this powerful speech that Dr. King gave. So I have a dream speech. Matter of fact, guys, if, if you have that, go ahead and cue up that I have a dream speech. I want to share a little bit from this. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. And one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. Wow, it's powerful, powerful speech, right? Did you know that little phrase, I have a dream? Did you know that was actually birthed out of a prayer meeting? There was a little girl named Prathia Hall. She's 22 years old. African-American young lady, she's praying in a church that had been burned down by the Ku Klux Klan. Standing in the middle of that rubble, Dr. King was with her at the prayer meeting, several other people, and as she's praying, how'd you like to have the name? Prathia. Her daddy named her after prayer. Her daddy was a black Baptist preacher who could go, and she could actually preach too. She was an amazing preacher. But she's 22 years old, and she starts praying, I have a dream in the middle of that rubble that hatred created. And she just named, starts naming off her own list. They were taking Dr. King to the airport. And uh, he said, young lady, that, that phrase you used was pretty powerful. He said, you mind if I borrow that? She said, yes, sir, by all means. Dr. King made that phrase part of his prayer life for over a year. He used that phrase, I have a dream, and came up with his own list for over a year. Then when he got ready to do the march in Washington, about a month before that, he's preaching in Detroit, and he was practicing the speech he was going to do a month later. He and his speechwriters, he always worked with speechwriters. They were putting the speech together. And then at the end, he said what he had been praying into for over a year. I have a dream. And his friend Mahalia Jackson was there. She was blown away by it, loved it. But his speechwriters were like, ah, oh, Doc, you know, that I have a dream stuff is a little too cliché. Why don't you uh, take that part out when we do it in Washington? So reluctantly, he agreed. So if you look at the I Have a Dream speech, you'll see where he's reading his speech verbatim. And if you listen to the right version of it, you hear somebody in the background say, Martin, tell him about the dream. That was Mahalia Jackson. And then he kicks in, I have a dream. And the notes were out the window, and he just... It's interesting how Prathia's prayer became Martin's vision for us all. Who's going to contend for the cry of the next generation? But it all happened because he overheard somebody else in a prayer meeting. Question, what kind of impact is your prayer life having on somebody else? I'm not saying that you need to be praying with one eye open. 
to see who's in the room. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what kind of imprint are we leaving on the next generation in prayer? So I love that speech because he said the sons of former slaves, sons of former slaves. But I want those sons of former slaves. And this kettle pot came from the slaves in my family. Used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking. They used it for washing clothes. But secretly, it was used for prayer. That's why it was passed down from generation to generation to generation. There are certain things that happen in prayer that allows you to connect to what the God of providence is doing in your lifetime and in your generation. That's why I don't think it's a mistake that this kettle pot comes from Lake Providence, Louisiana. What is Providence. Providence is, according to Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, providence is the continuous activity of God by which he preserves and governs. It's the way God looks over seemingly insignificant things and apparent accidents. In other words, you have no idea how many things God stopped from happening for you to get here because providence intervened. You have no idea how many things accidentally happened and you just happened to meet this person and just happened to meet that person. All those little divine coincidences that happened. You know, in the Hebrew language, they don't even have the word coincidence in the Hebrew language. But they believe that God oversees all the affairs of mankind because he's able to work all things together for the good of those who love him. who are called according to his purpose, right? And so the greatest New Testament understanding of that is in Ephesians 2 and 10 where it says well, we're God's workmanship in Christ Jesus and we're walking out the works that he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. The word workmanship, y'all, is a powerful word. It's the word poema. Everybody say poema. So here we're at poem in there, right? So think about it. You're God's poem. That's where the word came from. You hear a song. But even greater than that, the word poema was a word that was used to describe someone who's a skillful tailor and a fabric maker. In other words, God has a tailor-made plan, tailor-made destiny for all of our lives. Right? And it's connected to the families we're born into, the regions that we're from, the nations that we're in. And sometimes when people are weaving things together, it looks... Like a mess. You ever I have a sister used to do a lot of crocheting and stuff, and she'd be weaving something together, and on one side of that tapestry, it looked like a mess. So what are you doing? And then she'd turn it around to, to let me see what she was working on. That's what God is doing with this little story I'm about to share with you. Turning the tapestry around, listen, it looks like a lot's a mess with just knots and tatters and sickness and division. But listen, God is working on something, y'all, and it's beautiful. And you're being woven into the storyline of the ages because God is going to answer his son's prayer through us, through this church. So, like I said, I hadn't thought much about this pot. So I went to a little conference in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where a man named Dutch Sheets was talking about prayer. And he started talking about this interesting concept of prayer called synergy. What is synergy? Synergy is when you take two separate things and when you connect them together, it doesn't create an addition of power but a multiplicity of power, right? Like scientists say, and a lot of scientists are here right now and watching online, um, scientists say if you take two horses and put them together, if they're pulling the same load together, it creates so much exponential power, it's as if a third invisible horse has been added. That's synergy. In other words, it is, it's not about an, an addition of results, but a multiplicity of results released from just combined effort. That's in the natural. That's in the natural. So we get synergy in the natural just from working to... Together. But so what happens in the supernatural? When we work together, one could put a thousand on flight and two could put what? Ten thousand. That's synergy. So thinking about it, we start getting all this agreement in prayer between red, yellow, black, and white. We still got, start getting all this agreement in prayer with old, young, male, female. We can see the synergistic exponential release in the power of prayer like we've never seen before, right? Psalm 133 says of us, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. What? Unity is like the anointing oil flowing from Aaron's head onto his beard and onto his robe. And the Bible says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. I believe John 17 is a New Testament version of Psalm 133. God commands his blessing on a place. But then that says something that was so profound, y'all. He said this, not only can you agree in prayer with the person sitting next to you, you can also agree in prayer with a generation behind you. He's talking about how I was at his alma mater, where I worked for years. wasn't the president, though, but, but I, was the, I was the director there for many years. <laughs> Price for the Nations Institute. There, and uh, Dutch said he was leading the student body in prayer for revival to hit the school. And he heard the Lord say to him, Dutch, I want you to come in agreement with the prayers of the founder of this school. And, he, and Dutch thought to himself, okay, God, is this really you? Because that man is dead. He's been dead for about 30 years, and I know you're not talking to the dead. <laughs> 
And he said he heard the Holy Spirit say, I didn't say agree with him. I said agree with his prayers. His prayers are still alive before my throne. There are things I promised this man in prayer that I want to release into this school right now. But I can't do yet because I need this generation to come to agreement with that generation. I want to release the synergy of the ages coming together. In other words, God will start something in one generation and complete it exponentially through future generations. So find that scripture, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, which says, all these by faith, talking about the great heroes of faith. It says they were approved for their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. So that apart from us, they wouldn't be made perfect without us. In other words, there's a whole company of people, y'all, looking over the balcony of heaven saying, don't mess this thing up. God started something in us that he wants to complete exponentially through you. Jesus said it best when he said, what greater works than these are you going to do because I'm going to the Father. And he'll start something in one generation and complete it exponentially through future generations. When I heard of that, I was a wreck because I realized I had some unfinished business. And so do you. I remember this kettle pot that was in my family. Like I said, it was used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking. They used it for washing clothes, but it was passed down because secretly they used it for prayer. They were owned by a slave master there in Lake Providence, Louisiana, who would beat them for any reason, and praying was one of them. See, back then they wanted slaves to be Christians because they knew the Christian slaves made better workers. But they would pervert the gospel and say, slaves be obedient to your masters if you want to go to heaven. Now, we know we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. It's a gift of God so that no one should boast. But it was easy to teach slaves that back then because it was against the law for slaves to read and write. It was also against the law for anybody to teach them how to read and write. So the irony of the peculiar institution called slavery is that, yes, they wanted them to be Christians, but they didn't want them to pray because they felt like prayer would foster hope. And if they got hopeful, they felt like these, these folks would try to run away. So in that plantation, they were literally beaten if they were caught praying. I'll give an example of how cruel slavery was in that plantation. We had the story passed down about a great uncle of ours who went fishing without asking. And so they decided to strap him to a tree to make an example out of him. They put both arms and legs around either side of that tree. They took a leather strap with rocks and nails and glass attached to it, something like the cat and nine tails, and they beat this slave for father of ours until all the flesh was pulled out of his back. The family tried to save his life by taking a huge sheet and making it one big bang day by sticking a lard or grease on the sheet and wrapping it around his body to stop the flow of the blood. But in spite of their efforts and because of the cruelty, he bled to death and died. So that's how cruel slavery was on that plantation there in Lake Providence. And if they were called praying, they would be beaten as well. But listen, these folks who passed out in this pot in my family, even at a time of enslavement, as Christians, they love Jesus, and they decide to pray anyway. So what they would do is they would go into a barn late at night to make sure their prayer meeting wasn't seen. But to make sure it wasn't heard, they used this pot as an acoustic means to keep their prayers from being heard. So what they would do is they would take the pot, and they would invert it. They would turn it upside down on the cabin floor. Then when they, they would take three or four rocks and prop up the edges so it would be suspended off the ground about an inch or two. They would then prostrate themselves on the ground and put their lips in between the opening between the ground and the kettle so that this kettle pot muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And the story that was passed down with the pot is this, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time. So they prayed for the freedom of their children and the next generation. One day, freedom comes. There's this young teenage girl who decides to keep this pot and that story in our family. Now, why would she do that? She's probably thinking about all those who are dead and gone, who risked their lives to pray for her. In other words, she overheard somebody else praying for her. It impacted her life. It branded her. She's probably also thinking about all those who are too old to enjoy the freedom she's about to embrace. So she decides to keep this story in this pot in our family. So she passed the pot and the story down to Harriet Lockett. Harriet Lockett passed it on to Noah Lockett. Noah Lockett passed it on to William Ford Sr., who then passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. So I'm there at this conference thinking about the heart that God had given me for revival. And for the first time in many years, I remember this cast iron pot. And I thought, oh, my God, to whom much is given, yeah, much is required. 
You know, back then they had a slave master that kept them from praying. We have a willing master that keeps us from praying. You know what it's called? It's called social media, reels, <laughs> Instagram, social media, entertainment, whatever. It's like, thank God for basketball and all other types of entertainment, but we won't see what they saw unless we do what they did. They prayed in two rev powerful revivals that totally transformed and reformed the nation. They, you know, we feast and play, they fasted and prayed. Something's got to change, all right? But beyond the obligation, y'all, I thought about the privilege. I thought, oh, my God, I get to agree with the prayers of my forefathers for the freedom of the next generation. In other words, I get to take the baton of intercession and contend for something that happened in my family, that happened in my community, that happened in my nation. Shared that my friend Dutch Sheets, and he said, you know, I'm doing this prayer gathering in Washington, in, uh, well, across the country. I feel like you should come with me and take this kettle pot around the country. But he said, I need confirmation that, God, you really want me to use this kettle pot to represent the prayer bowls in heaven. Listen, Re Revelation 5 and 8, so there are golden bowls in heaven full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Every time you pray, it's collected not in a Tupperware bowl, but a golden bowl. You know why? Because that's how precious your prayers are to God. Listen, there's a prayer bowl over Huntsville. There's a prayer bowl over your family. There's a prayer bowl over Alabama. There's a prayer bowl over this nation. God's looking for a new generation to resource the prayer bowls once again. So Dutch said he was praying for confirmation, and his Bible falls open at Zechariah 14 and 20. And part B of that verse says, And the cooking pots in the house of the Lord shall be like the bowls before the altar. So here's this cooking pot that's caught up for prayers. The same way as a bowl in heaven that catches our prayers like incense. And Dutch said this to him. He said, William, wouldn't it be just like God in his justice and irony? They use the prayers of a slave generation to free a nation up for revival again. So I'm glad he said generation because it wasn't just black Christian slaves praying back then. They're also white Christian abolitionists, white revivalists. They knew that if any person was a slave, was a Christian, and the person was their brother. They laid their lives down for each other. Many of them also had their houses burned. They were shot. They were killed. They were even lynched because they chose to suffer with the people of God rather than just compromise and wink at slavery. And it was the prayers of that godly remnant of the people that birthed the first and the second great awakening in our nation. Had it not been for those revivals, slavery would have never ended. So listen, I'm daring to believe, listen, y'all, the same God that broke the power of Dred Scott. Dred Scott was that Supreme Court law back then that said slaves had no rights in the courtroom. Everybody thought that law sealed the fate of slavery in our nation. But because God sent revival, that law, that law got broken so radically in the hearts of people, folks were willing to fight for other folks that didn't look like them. That's why I'm daring to believe, y'all. Listen, the same God that broke the power of Dred Scott, he can break the power of a Roe v. Wade. He can put an end to systemic poverty. He can stop our schools from being a pipeline to prison. He can shut down crack houses in the city, in the inner city and shut down opiate, the opiate crisis in the suburbs. He can put an end to mass incarceration. He's just looking for a new generation of people who will drop their agendas and come together and believe. <laughs> Amen. And those type of folks help me realize something. Help me realize that uh, this part is not just... Part of my family history and heritage is yours, too. Those revivalists and abolitionists were fighting for their Christian brothers because they knew they were connected because of the blood of Jesus. And I realized, you know what? If my ancestors had been Muslim or Buddhist, I have no connection to this part of his history. But because they were Christians, listen, y'all, now these, my ancestors and forefathers, if you're a believer, these are yours, too. In other words, with... We're connected because of the blood of Jesus. I'm just as much a spiritual son of Charles Finney and Harriet Beecher Stowe as you are Martin Luther King and Harriet Tubman. And when we come together in that kind of unity, that kind of agreement, y'all, something powerful happens. Bowls begin to tip. Oil gets released. God finds another place he can release his commanded blessing. So... It's around that time... 2003, I had this powerful dream. The Lord said, you wouldn't want to be a part of this. You got to deal with your own baggage. And I've shared this before, but I want to share it again because there's a lot of people here who hadn't heard this story before. Around that time, I was coming to Montgomery, Alabama with my friend Lou Winger to do a prayer gathering at Dr. King's old church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. But the night before we go in there, I had a dream about the dream of Dr. King. 
In the dream, Dr. King, uh, well, Dr. King is at our house, and Lou Engel and I go by this house to pick up Dr. King to take him with us. Of course, it's a dream, right? So we go by this house, and Dr. King is alive. But in the dream, he has this humongous white duffel bag with black handles on it. And in the dream, he brings it out, and he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of that duffel bag. Then he throws the bag down violently, and he comes again to this vehicle with us. And in the dream, I thought to myself, man, that bag will make a nice souvenir, which shows you how carnal I am. Like, even in my dreams, I'm carnal. <laughs> I'm thinking, I went to Morehouse, he went to Morehouse, the bag will make a nice souvenir. So in the dream, I go try to pick up the baggage, but before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders and says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And in the dream, he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the racial divide in our nation. I wake up from the dream in tears. I didn't even realize I've been weeping the whole night in intercession. My pillow was soaked with tears. I shared the dream with my friend Lou Engel. He begins to weep and we start praying, God, what is the interpretation for this dream? Like, God, remind me, what did Dr. King say to me? And Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black candles. That would be the interpretation for your dream. And I realized the white bag represented my white baggage. The black handles represented how I, as an African-American man, had been hanging on to it. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. I knew what he was talking about because I know what it's like at 13 years old. Me and three other friends were coming out of a convenience store in a car load full of white guys. Started calling us the N-word. Said they were going to shoot and kill us. They chased us for almost two hours. We didn't know them. They probably were just joyriding. But listen, we, we, were, we were terrified. I know what it's like. In my 30s, get my first nice house in the suburbs, but every week for the first three months, the same police officer would pull me over just for driving while black. I know what that feels like. But you know what I had done? For every police officer and every right person in that region, I put those stories on everybody. I saw everyone through the veil of those experiences. I prejudged people. Isn't that the devil's diabolical plot? Before we had one conversation with each other, we saw some bad experience, some bad whatever, whatever bad memory we put on a whole group of people. And it's uh, interesting. That's what the accuser does. In Revelation 12, it says the devil is the, what? The accuser of the brethren. The word accuser, y'all, comes from this powerful Greek word. It's the Greek word kategoros. It's where we get the word category. In other words, the diabolical plot of the enemy is to get us to categorize or stereotype each other. So before we can have one conversation with each other, we put some bad experience, some bad narrative on other people. God said, was saying to me, William, get rid of your resentment. Get rid of your bitterness. Get rid of your unforgiveness. Get rid of your white baggage so you can get into a new vehicle that can be revival and justice for everybody. I feel like that's what God is saying to all of us in the church right now is this. What color is your baggage? Is it red, yellow, black, white, or brown? Or is it blue? Or is it red? Listen, from all the extremes we've seen on the right and the left, listen, y'all, left wing, right wing, the whole bird is sick. We want to see change, we need the dove back in America. I love how Sammy Rodriguez says it. He says, it's not about the donkey or the elephant, it's about the lamb. And he's going to use the United Church to heal a divided nation. Amen. So, after that, my friend Lou Engel says, you know, you need to share this story at the Lincoln Memorial, MLK Celebration Day, 2005, January 17, 2005. Come, share your story. But before we did that, I went up to that old pulpit at Dr. King's in Montgomery. Had this big, thick book called The Testament of Hope. Falls open to the I Have a Dream speech. And I start reading that speech like a prayer. And I get to the part where Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves, sons of former slave owners, sit together at the table of brotherhood. And I, for the first time I prayed, God, whatever happened to the family that owned our family where this kettle pot came from? But little did I know that Mr. Poema was connecting me to some more unfinished business. I want to bring up my good friend, Matt Lockett. Please come <laughs> share. What an honor to be with you. I've been hearing stories about this place. I'm kind of excited about this champion summit. 21 days of fasting, and you guys are going to get nuked this weekend. <laughs> kind of jealous. 
No, it is a high honor actually to be with you here tonight and of course, uh, Chief, to be with you uh, tonight and for the next couple of, of days. We just have come with a lot of expectation in our own hearts and it's a privilege just to be able to serve you and to serve this house tonight. And I know you've had a kind of a longer relationship with Will. He was kind of the, the warm-up act, if you will. So I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, what I would like to do is make sure that you're out of here by 945. Just kidding. Ease up a little bit. <laughs> 930. Okay, good. I would like to start uh, right where Will left off in the story. We're going, we're going somewhere tonight. We're on a trip here. We're taking you with us. And I'm going to start right where Will left off. And it was this prayer meeting that Lou Engle had invited him to. It was January 17th, 2005. And what I would like to do is, is back up one year before that, and I want to tell a story, uh, my half of the story, and show you how God knit our lives together and how the stories joined and, and really began to flow together. And so I want to back up a year. And you know it's interesting to me that it, it was actually one year exactly to the day. January 17th, 2004, when my dad unexpectedly passed away. And I'm looking around, I see a lot of young faces in this room, so no doubt there's a lot of people that have not gone through that experience yet where you've lost mom and dad. And, and uh, I can promise you, someday you will. And what happens in a moment like that is actually really profound because if you think about it, you've spent your entire life receiving from them. And you know, your mom, your dad, or maybe it's your grandparents, but you receive from them, you receive their provision, you receive a roof over your heads, hopefully, all the stories that come with your family, the good, the bad, and the ugly, yeah. right? Every family's got it. You think you're the good, you're probably the bad, but you're definitely the ugly. <laughs> True story, right? But you've been receiving all of that your whole life, and then all of a sudden, when you lose mom and dad, something really profound happens because now a, a mantle gets passed to the next generation. A mantle of the storytelling goes to you. You become the steward of the storyline. And maybe you've never thought of it that way, but when that happens, you have to start asking some really big questions that need really, really big answers. And for me, now I became a Christian when I was 15 years old. I was the only Christian in my family growing up. And you know, thank God for a pastor who sent his kid to public school and sh shared his faith with me. <laughs> I got saved that way. But only, only Christian in my family. And, and uh, you know, I, I was wanting to know, here I am a, now at the time that I lost my dad. I'm a grown man in my 30s. And I'm asking, question, asking questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life that you've given me? And you know, that, that might sound a little trite to some people. You might wonder, like, man, that's, that's, the, that's questions that weak people ask, right? And the truth of the matter is that it doesn't matter if you're 16 or 60. Your Heavenly Father wants you to ask those kinds of questions. Why? Because He wants to answer them for you. Your Heavenly Father wants to tell you who you are. He wants you to know who He says you are, not what everybody else says you are. He wants you to know who he says you are and what the purpose is that he's designed for your life. So here I am, a grown man, and I start asking these questions. And it was during that time that it became really important to me to, to find out something about my family. I wanted to know something about my family tree. It just became very important during that time after I lost my dad. Now, in my dad's family, that was a, that was a tall order because my dad was one of 16 siblings, I'm just going to let that sit there for a minute because they don't make mammals like they used to. <laughs> My dad grew up in Kentucky on a tobacco farm and he was one of 16 siblings. 
But in my dad's family, they didn't know the story of where the lockets came from. They couldn't get past their own grandfather because somewhere along the way, you know, in some cases there were courthouse fires where records were lost. But more importantly, somewhere along the way, somebody just stopped telling the stories. For whatever reason, probably painful ones, but by the time you get to my dad's generation, they didn't know anything about where the lockets came from. In fact, my dad would make a joke out of it, painful joke actually, and he would just say, we're just a bunch of mutts from Kentucky. But he wanted to know just like everybody else. And so I decided, this was in 2004, that I was going to start researching and digging, and I'm going to get the breakthrough on the family tree little presumptuous on my part. And so I spent the better part of that year digging. And you know what? I hit all the same roadblocks that everyone in my family ever hit. And so I was finishing that year more frustrated than I started because I knew nothing. I had discovered nothing about it. And it was during that time, very painful time for me, that I had a dream. Now, time out. Talking about dreams. Now, Will talked about dreams. I'm going to talk about dreams. Oh boy, are there dreams. But I'm not talking about the kind where you go to sleep at night and see weird stuff and pizza gets all the credit. Everybody gets those dreams from time to time. I'm talking about the kind where you go to sleep at night and you feel like the God of the universe is speaking your language. And he does that because... He wants you to discover something. And so I had a dream during this time, and this dream came from somewhere else. It didn't like bubble up from anything that I already knew about. It didn't, you know what I mean by that bubble up? Like you have a bad day and stuff just kind of comes up, right? It wasn't like that. There were three things about this dream that, that struck me. I don't have time tonight to tell you that dream, but in this dream, God began to speak to me about how he was going to change the culture of this nation and how he was going to do it through day and night prayer specifically how he was going to end abortion and overturn Roe v. Wade. And he was going to do that through day and night prayer. But there were three things about this dream that I didn't, I didn't understand. Number one, I didn't really know anything about prayer, especially day and night prayer. To me, prayer is what you did on Wednesday night. Here we are on a Wednesday night. Prayer is what you do on Wednesday night at church where you spend 45 minutes talking about somebody's grandma with a broken hip. And 15 minutes for God to, you know, you pray for God to give her strength to endure the affliction. <laughs> Talking meetings, not prayer meetings. So I didn't, you know, that's not totally my experience, but amen or oh me. So I didn't know anything about prayer. Number two, I didn't know anything about abortion, I'm sad to say. But I was content to just let other people worry about that. I've since learned that just because it's not important to me doesn't mean it's not important to God. But number three, third part of this dream that, that really struck me was that there was a man in my dream named Lou Engle, but I didn't know Lou Engle. So I dreamt about this man that I did not know. So this dream, that's what I mean by it came from somewhere else, but it got a hold of me. Somehow God gave me a dream that put a demand on my life. I started looking, I found out there's a real guy named Lou Engle. He's really doing this thing with prayer. And I somehow managed to get a phone number of somebody that worked with him. So I called them up on the phone. I'm thinking, this is weird. But I cold called him and I said, hey, I don't know you and you don't know me, but I had a dream. And he was like, really, what was your dream? <laughs> I was not expecting to be taken seriously. <laughs> I was just going to drop that off right there and I've done my part. But he says, tell me your dream. And so I told him, he says, this is very interesting. You've just dreamt exactly what God is sending us to do. We're going to Washington, D.C. to pray for the ending of abortion. And we're doing this. We're going to do a prayer gathering on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on Martin Luther King Day. Maybe you should come to it. God might have something for you there. Now, this is weird. Like, I don't know. I lived in Colorado at the time. Like, God, do you really want me to go all the way across the country to a prayer meeting. I could do that here and not have to take time off work and spend hard-earned money, right? And, uh, you know, you go through the moments like that where you, you, you need God to confirm things to you. Do you guys play the confirmation game? We spiritualize it and we say it's like Gideon, you know. But it's the confirmation game. It's like round one. 
you create this incredibly complex calculus equation. And you put it before God and you say, if you can do this, then I'll know that it's you talking to me. And we're not supposed to test God, but God's like, and then he does it. And you're like, hmm, round two. (laughs) And you do it again. (laughs) You know exactly what I'm talking about. Good, because I'm in good company, because that's what I did. God confirmed, I want you to go to this prayer meeting across the country. Now, I have a picture of it. If you could put up the first image, please. Uh, I want you to see it. I like to do a little show and tell. And um, uh, this is a picture that we're going to show you. Here it is. This is that prayer meeting that Will and I were talking about. Now, you can see in the background there, that's the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, That's where Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. And not a huge gathering, you know, it's probably about the same size of the, you know, this room here tonight, this many people. Uh, If you know who Lou Engle is, you'll recognize him on the right third of the screen. But if you look at the left side, that arm, that that blue arm that's extended, if you follow it all the way out to the end of the fingertips, you'll see that that's Will Ford. So the first place that Will and I ever came together was right there on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. Now, I didn't really know why I was there. God led me there, but I didn't know why I was there. I didn't know why I had to pray for, you know, I did to pray outside. Why are we praying outside? In January. For eight hours. It was zero degrees that day. It's, it was really, really cold. You can see people are bundled up. Um... Praise God for the guitar players. Oh, yeah, there were guitarists out there, and it was that cold. But, you know, I showed up. Sometimes you just got to show up. Follow the voice. How many of you seen that movie, uh, Field of Dreams? That old Kevin Costner movie from the eight. I love that. It's one of my favorite movies. It starts off at the beginning when he says, I never did a crazy thing until I heard the voice. That, that, that's like my life story right there. So I showed up and uh, uh, we prayed all day. And then that night there was a guest speaker. It was a man named Will Ford. And he brought out this kettle and he told the story that you've just heard here tonight. Now it's exactly one year to the day since my dad died. I was an emotional mess that day thinking about it knowing that I didn't know anything about my own family history. And yet I'm listening to this story And he's talking about this rich spiritual heritage of his family, of his ancestors who prayed, and they prayed for this this nation and for the next generation. And that cut me to the core. But then he shared this detail that this kettle was handed down to Harriet Lockett, who gave it to Nora Lockett, who gave it to Wilford Sr., to Wilford Jr., to Wilford III, the man on the stage. And I had my 10-year-old daughter with me, and... uh, she turned to me and she said, Daddy, he just said our name. And I, I'm so struck by that. And so after the meeting, I actually came up to the, the front of the, the church service there. And we were at the altar. And I met Will for the first time. And we began to compare notes. He actually quizzed me because he'd never met a locket before. And uh, he said, well, how do your lockets spell their name? With one T or two? And I said, two. And he said, well, our locket spelled it with one. Where are your lockets from? And I said, well, we don't really know. My dad's from Kentucky. And he said, well, our lockets were down in Louisiana. And we just thought it was this amazing coincidence that uh, it was just, it, it drew us together. You know, the first thing that Will and I ever did together was pray. We prayed for this nation. We repented for, uh, on behalf of this nation for the sins of the past. And we re- prayed for the release of forgiveness for the next generation. I'm so thankful that the, th- the first thing we ever did together, Will, was pray together. We met in a prayer meeting. Well, that just kind of like became this pivotal point in my life where God changed everything. I left the marketplace. God called me out of that career. And I became a full-time missionary in Washington, D.C., the hardest and darkest. (laughs) How many of you have been to Washington, D.C.? Oh, quite a few of you. How many of you went there to pray? Okay, okay. You should all come to Washington, D.C. All the demons do. (laughs) You should come too. (laughs) 
So I became a, a missionary with Lou Engel, been in Washington, D.C. now for 17 years. We just celebrated our 17th anniversary in October. And uh, praise God, right now, here we are contending for life. And it could very well be that Roe v. Wade gets overturned in the next few months. Pray that it does. So fast forward. I got to speed up this story. Lou Engel, he's known for doing these large-scale prayer gatherings, and he was going to do one in the state of Virginia, so that's just south of Washington, D.C., and he, uh, he knew that, that before we, we went there to do that prayer gathering, first we have to go pray at a place called Appomattox Courthouse. Now, that's very significant. We had a dream at the very beginning of our house of prayer and I do want to share this dream because it is pertinent to the story. In the dream, we were being led through a huge building that was filled with courtrooms. And we were being taken from one courtroom to the next. And in the dream, the Lord spoke through this dream and he said, either you deal with Roe v. Wade in your courts or I will deal with it in mine. And at the end of a long hall was a huge courtroom and on the door it said Appomattox Courthouse. Now, what is Appomattox Courthouse? Why is God taking that kind of language and putting it in a dream now? Appomattox is the place where generally surrendered to grant. It marks the end of the American Civil War. It's the end of the bloodiest thing this nation's ever faced. So this dream apprehended us, and we've prayed for years, God, we don't want to have to go back to another Appomattox. And so I believe that God has been taking us through this journey of prayer all these years, praying according to that dream. So now fast, you know, we're back in this moment where Lou says we have to go pray at Appomattox. We'd never actually been there. And so we went out there, and that's a historical site. You can go there yourself. It's in the middle of Virginia. And the uh, place has been preserved, the McLean Farmhouse. You can actually go in the, that room. We stood in the room where Lee surrendered. And you know what we did? We prayed for another great surrender to come to America. Only this time, a voluntary one to God. I believe this, is be the, this will be the precursor to a great revival in America. But we were going to leave, and we went into this visitor center, and Lou and I were standing side by side at a bookcase, and he grabs the first book off the shelf that caught his eye, and it was this book right here, and he opens it to a random page. And don't you wonder, what is it about God that he likes to make books fall open to pages? But I want you to see, if you could put up the next image, the page that he turned to. It's called The Last Shot, The Battle of Lockett's Farm. And Lou asked me what it was. I had no idea, so I bought the book began to study it. You know, here it is. I'm in a moment now. It feels like a historical moment where I'm hearing my name called again. What I found out is that when Lee was in retreat across the state of Virginia, right before the end, he gets to a place called Sailor's Creek, and it's there in front of a, a farmhouse uh, that he fights his last battle, and it's called the Battle of Lockett's Farm. So this is a photo of that house, just so you don't think I'm exaggerating, there's a historical marker right in the front yard that says, here Lee fought his last battle. Well, I'm studying this and I'm stunned by it, but it was about that same time that my older brother got the breakthrough in our genealogy. And he called me, he says, I got us all the way back to the year 1645. We came in as settlers through Virginia. And I said, Virginia, if I got a Virginia story for you, and I started to tell him about the end of the Civil War, and he stops me and says, that's not that place by Sailor's Creek, is it? So that is exactly where it is. Why? He said, well, I just found the documents on it. That was our family. So here's what you need to understand. After years of praying the Appomattox Courthouse dream that we know God gave us, I found out that the last battle of the American Civil War happened in my family's front yard. Would you agree? That seems significant. Actually, I found the place. You saw the house. We went there, and I met the man who owns that house, and I was stunned when he invited me in and framed and hanging on the living room wall was the Lockett family tree. I have my brother's research there. It's a hand and a glove. This was my family. There's no question. 
And he asked me, what do you know about your family? And I said, not much. And he said, you know, some of you left here and went to Kentucky. And some left and went to the deep south. Some were involved in very significant historical events. But then he said this, some of, you, some of you left here and went to Louisiana. And in some cases, those handwritten census ledgers, there was a clerical error and they accidentally dropped one of the T's and changed the spelling of your name. Now I was thinking what you're thinking right now, that can't be true. But I gathered all this new information up and I went down to Dallas where my friend Will lives. And we just laid it out. Will, why don't you share with them what we found out? Yes, yeah, so Matt flies from D.C. to Dallas, lays all this information out. And we just honestly just talked and prayed and cried as we shared our family's research. So my, only, my oldest known family member was believed to be a man named Isaac Lockett. Shows up in the 1870 census. He's there in Lake Providence, Louisiana. He's 90 years old. But in that census, he said he was originally from Virginia. You know, slaves always took on the last names of people who owned them back then, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so either he was, he was transferred or connected to a friend or a family, whatever, but he was moved from Virginia to Lake Providence, where my father and grandfather all grew up. So that led to more research, finding out that my grandfather, he was originally born Lawrence Lockett, but his grandparents, who were born right at the end of slavery, Levi and Harriet Lockett, they didn't want him to have a slave last name. So they changed his name from Lawrence Lockett to William Lawrence Ford. They just gave him the name, family name of another family friend and gave him the name of another family friend. That led to another year and a half of research, learning that we had family members, Levi and Harriet actually, especially Levi came out of Alabama. And Matt had family members that went from Virginia to Alabama. And we just start seeing what all these different connections with his family and my family. So after a year or more research, we, here's where we realized it was my friend Matt Lockett's family who owned my family where this kettle pot came from. So think about it. Here's my family praying for the ending of slavery. And then all the way up at the farmhouse of the people who originally owned them, slavery comes to enter their front yard. But then, because he's the guy of the past and the future, and Mr. Poema, he loves to heal history, he connects two people from those same right. family lines together, Matt Lockett and I, so we can war against injustice in our day and cry for awakening in our time, Amen. because that's the kind of God we serve, right? Amen. Come on. It's so powerful. <laughs> Amen. Let me share some more with you. I mean, the story is crazy. I mean, this is like the little bit of it. We got more, talk about more of it in the book. Other thing we realized was this. Matt found out, that's how crazy this story is. Um, Matt found out he had these other two family members named Lee, named, uh, Napoleon, Napoleon Lockett Mary. and Mary Lockett. Here, they were here in, Louisa, here in uh, Alabama. They moved from Virginia to Alabama. Over in Marion County. Over in Marion County, Alabama. And they were like the Southern Bell aristocrats of their day, all right? And so uh, Napoleon was a lawyer and a planner, but he but himself, he owned 126 slaves. Between he and his 11 children, they owned hundreds of slaves. And his wife was like the gone with the wind aristocrat. And she didn't like the fact that the Southern White House, the Confederate White House, didn't have its own flag. So Mary Lockett hired a designer, and she came up with the idea for the Confederate flag, and she hand can, sewed it in her house. Can you put up the image of their portraits? And she hand sewed it in her house and hand delivered it to her friend Jefferson Davis, and that's, that's Napoleon and uh, Mary. And if you go to the next slide, this is the Confederate White House. It's there in Montgomery, Alabama. And her portrait hangs in that White House. And, and that flag is the flag that she designed called the Stars and the Bars. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. All right. So uh, if, if you go to the next slide, they thought, you know, well, that flag looks too much like, you know, the Union flag on the battlefield. Let's come up with a Confederate battle flag. So here's the rebel flag that everybody's more familiar with. But listen, think about it, because God heard the prayers of black Christian slaves, white Christian abolitionists all around the country. And even in this family, we'll get to that in a second. Listen, through the same family where the flag of rebellion was raised up. Next slide. The flag of surrender goes up in their front yard because God heard praying people. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. Yeah. 
So the thing that we really need you to understand is that this story isn't what connected Will and I. The night that we met 17 years ago on Monday, so we met on January 17th, which was Martin Luther King Day again. So, so this was our 17th anniversary. That night we met, we didn't know any of this. We didn't, we didn't find any of this out until we had been praying together for about a decade. You know what would have happened if we found it out the first night? Probably a fist fight. <laughs> No, you know what? We would have probably shaken hands, we'd given, given each other a gratuitous uh, smile and a you know, greeting, and then we would have socially distanced for the rest of our lives, hoping to never see that guy again. I think it's a little bit of a picture of what's going on in the nation. But instead, God puts us together and gives us 10 years of relationship. For 10 years, we pray together. I fight for his dreams, he fights for mine. I love his family, he loves mine. But now think about this. All of a sudden, I find out that I have a connection. I've been listening to this story for a decade. And I found out that I'm connected to this story. And you know what? I'm connected to the worst parts of it. I'm connected to that of the slave owner. That was hard. Beloved, that was very hard. Because suddenly now things aren't, you know, it's not a theory anymore. Suddenly... I know the pain of the stories, the pain of, that Will has experienced, the pain of an entire community became real to me because it had a face and a name, and it was the face of somebody that I loved, and that changed it. But it's almost like God needed us to get to this place of relationship and love for one another first, before then he could reveal this and say, let me show you what I want to do. Well, now, he left us there for another year and a half. And that was hard. Left us there for a year and a half. That was hard before we knew the rest of the story. So, you know, we were, we were in a prayer movement, right? So we love when God answers prayers. Don't y'all love when God, I mean, just crazy. Just, oh, my God, there's a trip. You're used to, your people used to own my people. We met at MLK Celebration Day at the Lincoln Memorial at the place where Dr. King said, oh, my God, this is a trip. That lasted for about three months. After the fizzle kind of wore off, the sizzle wore off, I was like, hold up. Your people used to own my people. <laughs> What about Uncle Willie? You know, I mean, for real, I, I was surprised. I, I literally, That's real. I, I had, I was surprised I had anger that came to the surface. I don't know if it was what I was feeling around the country or, or my own personal life or whatever, my own family, but I had to deal with it. You know, we talked about it one on one because now I'm dealing with this. I, I'm seeing the face of somebody that I love sitting across the table from my friend trying to forget how his family was ever my family's enemy. But then, you know what? I remember that's why God gave me the dream. And you know what I did? I went to a deeper level of forgiveness. I went to a deeper level of healing. Not just me, my brother, my sisters, we all did. Right? So God took us a lot of healing. You know, once the lid came off on the family tree, it was just a treasure trove. You know, no one in my family had ever known this stuff. And what I found out, really quite miraculously, I was praying one day, and the Lord had me reading a book about revival And it was talking about how during the previous war to the Civil War, during the Revolutionary War, when Washington and the Continental Army is on the move, revival came to that central part of Virginia. And I'm reading a historical account about that revival, and it talks about how several men were caught up in that revival and became Methodist circuit riders. And here, I turn the page, and it gives a list of their names, and right there in the list is Daniel Lockett, one of my ancestors. I pull out the family tree, right place, right time. We knew he was a preacher. We didn't know, or we knew he was a pastor. We didn't know that he was a circuit rider. And I was talking with Pastor Lisa before the meeting tonight. This is wildly significant because when you study that subject, you find out that, see, the the people are spreading out in the new frontier. There weren't churches. And so these guys called the circuit riders, they took the gospel to where the people were, and they did it on horseback. And so in their saddlebags, they carried Bibles and hymnals. But you know what? They also carried at that time in history a thing called a manumission form. That is a legal document that allows you to set your slaves free. Now, how would you like to be in that altar call? 
where you come forward to receive Christ and you are told, oh, by the way, it is for freedom that Christ sets you free. And then you're given an opportunity to set your slaves free at the same time. That is exactly what happened because when you look at it and you look at the numbers, everywhere the circuit riders rode, the population of freed slaves exploded in the new world. So here it is. Yes, my family, I have this horrible connection to, uh, or a connection to this, this horrible storyline in my family of slave owners. But what I, what I see now is that God had already started another story. In my family, he had already started a story with Daniel, and I've locked in on it because, yes, there's pain in my family, but there's another story, and it's one of revival and abolition. Yeah, revival, abolition, and healing. It's like all of our families, right? We have these things called generational blessings and generational curses, right? To represent these dominating themes of what our family is all about, right? Like I have family members that have done stuff in prison. I've done stupid stuff I'm not proud of, but thank God for the blood of Jesus. But we had these folks back here praying for revival, praying for the ending of slavery and just releasing generational blessings. It's like all of our families have these things called generational blessings, generational curses. It represents these dominated themes of storylines. And that's what God is shouting to America right now is this. What storyline do we want to be a part of? The healing or the hurt? The blessing or the curse? What storyline are we going to be a part of? Let me share with you last story. Let me give you just an illustration that makes this point that Will's sharing right now. See, during the time of slavery, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write, and it was illegal for anyone to teach them how to read and write. And then after slavery ends, guess what? It still wasn't very popular. So this legacy of secret meetings would continue where you would have former slaves trying to learn how to read and write, but they would do it in secret because they feared there would be consequences. And so there in the Lockett Homestead area in Virginia... There's a former slave who's trying to teach her young son how to read and write. And in one night walks Lucy Lockett, one of my family, and she catches them red-handed. And of course, they were doing it in secret because they feared consequences. But instead, and I have to look at it this way, Lucy has to choose a different storyline. And in that moment, she looks at the mother and says, no, what you've chosen to do is very wise. And Lucy then takes up tutoring this young boy and the only reason we know the story in that level of detail is because he wrote about it in his autobiography. That little boy was Robert Russell Moton. He went on to replace Booker T. Washington as president of Tuskegee Institute. He was an educational advisor to presidents. And if you could put up the last image, please. In May of 1922, he gave the dedication speech of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., where 41 years later, Dr. King would stand on that spot and declare, I have a dream. And exactly 41 years after that, Will and I would meet on the exact same spot. Isn't that, that's crazy. So think about it. This happened to two men who were led by dreams to meet each other at the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day, at a prayer meeting, at the very spot where Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Come on, y'all. Maybe the dream speech wasn't poetry. Maybe it was prophecy. Maybe there's a dream king called the King of Kings, and his father's still going to answer his son's prayer. Father, I pray that they be one so that your glory could come, so that the world would believe. Maybe God hadn't forgotten about the prayers of our mamas and our papas. Come on, y'all. Let's turn this into a prayer meeting for a little while. So, Jesus, we come before you. Father, we overheard your son praying for us. And it's branded our hearts. Your son has answered so many of our prayers for us, for salvation, provision. Would you allow us to answer his prayer? Oh, God, would you use your united church yes. to heal a divided nation? If you feel comfortable, you want to come forward. You know what? Can we turn this into an altar? 
Let's turn this into a prayer. I mean, come forward if you want to come and pray. We pray right now for our nation with all that's going on. God, with social distancing, has revealed the social distance in our hearts. Good Lord, but Lord, you, you only reveal in order to heal. The God of providence. Oh God, you're not surprised by any of the events going on in our nation right now. Thank you for turning the tapestry around every time we see somebody healed, every time we hear somebody being delivered, every time we see the hunger level increasing in the body of Christ. But Lord, we ask for your son's unfinished business. We ask for the unfinished business of our forefathers, God. So that generations even yet to be created can praise you. God, would you tip the bowls in heaven over Alabama once again, God? Answer your son's prayer, Jesus. this storyline. Yes. Lord, the storyline of our families, the storyline of the journeys that you've had us all on, God. We want to steward it well tonight that where there is mistakes, God, we want to correct those mistakes, God, and even repent, God, for the mistakes of the past, God. I pray that your people would be gripped, God, with a spirit of repentance. God, even in families right now, God, we pray for families where there's been generation after generation of curses rolling down. We say it ends tonight in the name of Jesus. God, we interrupt, God, that that rolling down of the curses, and we plead the blood of Jesus right now, God, where the curse would stop. And now, God, we ask you to release blessing in its place. God, release blessing. Connect us, God, tonight to that unfinished business, the story that you've already started that maybe we don't even know about yet. God, I'm asking, God, plug us into that plan. Plug us into the unfinished business, God. Release blessing, God, into the next generation. Yes, Lord. God, we don't want to hand off curses yes, Lord. to the younger ones, God. It, God, and raise up mothers and fathers. Turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children to the fathers. God, just as Dr. King contended for Patriot's prayer to be made manifest, raise up mothers and fathers who contend for the cry of the next generation. God, we pray for Generation Z. Lord, the first generation to grow up on the internet, the first generation to grow up in the middle of a pandemic. God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, Lord, that you will restore hope in the midst where the enemy is trying to bring so much hopelessness. We break the power of hope deferred off of a generation that feels so hopeless. And God, we ask you that you would turn the hearts of mothers and fathers back to their children in deep, profound ways. Luke 1, 17, turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient back to the attitude of the righteous. God, we ask that you would do that in this day and this time. Break in. I just want to say this too while we're here. It's been a while since I've been here, but I just want to say for anybody here or just watching online, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to tell you that you probably heard it before. You probably thought it was cliche. God loves you, and he has a really good plan for your life. Listen, I'm living proof. We're living proof. This story didn't happen to me because I'm a nice little guy. I had a decent little prayer life. I could do a whole lot better, y'all, to be honest. I had some people 200 years ago contending for me in the place of prayer. I had a praying grandfather, a praying grandmother, praying mama. Listen, somebody's been praying for you. And it wasn't just 200 years ago. Two weeks ago, it's right now, even in this church, this is a praying church. It's not a coincidence that you're here listening to this message tonight. God wants you to know, the same way he hunted us down, he's hunting you down. I talked about my uncle who unwillingly gave his back to be beaten. But listen, y'all, Jesus Christ willingly gave his back to be beaten for us all. And by his stripes, he's healing history. 
and he wants to heal your history. Whatever you've gone through personally, this is not just about the history of Alabama or a nation. This is about your personal history, your personal storyline. God wants to weave you into his plan for your life that's connected to the unfinished business in your family, to your region, even to the whole nation. So I just want to say to you that wherever you are in your walk with God, know that he's after you. He's after you and he loves you. I'll just let you pray that out in your own way. Ask him into your heart. Ask him into your life. And I want to pray for those in the place of prayer who have been gone through a thing of fatigue. You know, the, that's the thing about prayer. You know, it starts off in inspiration, but it lasts through dedication. It doesn't always feel good to be in a prayer meeting. Ask the folks who passed down this pot. Imagine how scared they must have been. Yeah, they had their, probably had their moments where they felt God, and there were probably times they didn't, but they were faithful. Question, are you faithful to the prayer meeting in your house? Faithful to the prayer meeting in your church? When you don't feel like it, whatever it is, God is looking for a people who will dedicate themselves to be the house of prayer. So, Father, I want to pray a refreshing over intercessors right now. In the name of Jesus, God, I break off, Lord. Hope deferred where it's made the heart sick. I break off anxiety. I break off even, Lord, just the, just the things around us, Lord, that is breaking us out of our patterns. But I ask you, Lord, that you would arrest our affections, that you would capture our heart, that you would lift the gaze of intercessors in this season, Lord. Now break discouragement off you right now in the name of Jesus. We need you now more than ever. We call you back to your post. We call you back to your place on the wall for your family, for this community, for Huntsville, for Alabama, for this nation. We call you back to your place on the wall in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I truly believe that we've been a part of a Kairos moment. And so we need to make it not only purpose, purposeful, personal, but I want to tell you this, Matt and Will, what you don't know is since Friday, my son and his wife are over the southeast region of circuit riders out of Huntington Beach, California. 41 of them have been staying here at the church getting ready to go out. A part of that group is our Black Voices group that is in the circuit rider movement. And they've been on the, these two rows right here getting to hear this message tonight. Ordained timing of God. You can't make that stuff up. So what I want us to do right now, because we're held responsible for this, this story, this message, it is our heritage on both of their sides. We should walk out of this room never the same again, but with a responsibility to pray. And so this is what I'd like for us to do. I'd like for you to stretch your hand out towards uh, Judge Parker, Will, and Matt. They have a divine appointment if the three of you will just stand together. 
I want some of our pastors to come and surround them right now. Black voices, where are you? Will you get you you get over there. God, we count it a privilege and an opportunity. This is such a divine moment. It's such a holy moment that we get to step into right now. And God, I thank you that you've trusted this house to be a part of this moment. Thank you. This is not just another night. We have the opportunity to right now to come into agreement with what's about to take place tomorrow and Friday. That God in the hearing of 3,000 judges across the state of Alabama that represent our judicial system. God, I pray right now, wherever they are, if they're in a hotel room or if they're in their home, if they're driving, wherever they are, God, I pray you would dispatch heaven to begin to open up their heart, open up their mind and receive the word, not just a story, not a feel good story, not a story that's going to maybe bring a tear to it. All right, God. But God, a story that's going to rivet their very spirit. I pray clearly that they would hear the word of justice. I pray clearly that through it, they're going to see your son, Jesus, which is the one who brings freedom. And God, I pray for Chief Justice Parker. God, I thank you for this man. Thank you, God, for his heart. Thank you how he has stayed the course. Thank you that he is leading the state of Alabama. Thank you that you dropped this in his heart to do tomorrow. God, I pray that the presence of God would enter that room. When they walk in the door, they won't even know what's hit them. But you're going to have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Promise me that you'll pray over the next two days. Promise me that you'll go back and you will watch this again and realize the responsibility that we have as the people of God to stand on this and bring revival to our nation. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We love you so much. Oh, the book is out in the foyer if you want to get their book.